It's so good to be with, to be here today with all of you. And thankfully, no one's mentioned my catfish. Yes. Yesterday, I, John and I went to a memorial for uh, Chuck Baker, the pastor. He'd been the pastor at uh, uh, McPherson for years. And we went to the memorial yesterday, and everyone I, I, everyone I bumped into, instead, they didn't say, how are you, or how is Delta? It was, hey, I saw your fish on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> but, praise the Lord. Delta was helping me out there, too. Stuck it on Facebook. This morning, I want to share a very important principle in the Word of God. And that is the fact that Jesus is the Lamb of God. In the Gospel of John, chapter 117, it's recorded that when John the Baptist saw Jesus, that he pointed to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was a tremendous statement. Uh, you know, we get so used to, you know, when you've been a Christian for, you get so used to all these terminology and stuff that sometimes we forget the power behind what they were saying. He says, is the next one on there? Yeah, 19. That's okay. You, can, you all know what it says. You can look it up. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John and I got back late from that service, and so we threw all this together real late. So I apologize to Robin. For, there it is. We've done a little Bible search right here for a minute. Yeah, we'll just, we'll just move on. You see, when, when these churches on television, it's not that these kind of things don't happen, but they edit it out. <laughs> But you're here, so you, we can't fool you. you know. yeah. We messed up here. In the Gospel of John, it says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, what did John the Baptist mean when he pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, when we talk about the Lamb of God, or the blood of the Lamb, or the blood of Jesus, or pleading the blood, covering with the blood, the blood of the cross, these are all re referring to the cross on which Jesus died. And the powerful way to cross, the cross destroys all evil in this present world and will overthrow all the powers of the darkness. You know, in in uh, 1 Corinthians 1.18, it says, The preaching of the cross is to those who perish foolishness. But to us who are saved, it's the power of God. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit to do what my words cannot do. To take your word and make it that living word, that powerful word, that will set us free, that will transform our lives. And we will thank you for this. 
for we ask it in the name of Jesus, who is Lord of all. Amen. So today what I want to do is do a scriptural overview of what it means that Jesus is the Lamb of God. The first place in the Bible where we have a lamb being sacrificed is in Genesis 4 verse 4. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. And then there's a verse in, in Hebrews that says, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. The first lamb in the Bible that was offered was offered by Abel. And it says, God declared him righteous because of that. In other words, from that time on, God looked at Abel as a righteous person and gave him the righteousness that's going to come later through Jesus Christ whom the Lamb symbolized. If you have a relationship with God's Lamb, Jesus Christ, God accepts you, God loves you, and God sees you as a righteous person. He didn't see all the mishaps and mistakes. He sees you as someone in whom the righteousness of his son has been imparted. If you will believe it, it's true. Well, the second mention in the Bible of sacrificing a lamb is in Genesis chapter 22. I believe it's verse 11 through 13. Abraham was asked if he would sacrifice his son Isaac, and Abraham reluctantly said yes. And so they go up to Mount Moriah, which is later going to be part of Jerusalem. They go up to Mount Moriah, Moriah, which later you know became be called Zion. And on the way up the mountain, Isaac, he, he he was a good Sunday school kid. He paid attention. He goes, Well, where's the lamb? And Abraham said to him, God will provide the lamb. They go up there. He places Isaac on the altar. He raises the knife, but before he can plunge it, this is what happens. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. In verse 13 it says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Now this is, a, this, this is something real important for us to understand. Jesus, the Lamb of God, saved us from the burnt altar, the bronze altar in front of the temple. He saved us from that, just like he did Isaac. He 
And in this instance, once again, the lamb was offered for one person. It caused one person to escape the fire. And that's, that's very important to understand. The lamb was killed to show that Jesus is the lamb was willing to die for one person. You know, I've had, you know, smarter like youth directors say, well, there's no place the Bible says Jesus would die for you by yourself. Oh, yes, there is. When that lamb was slain for Isaac, Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, was letting us know he would have sacrificed himself for you and you alone. Well, let's go on to the third one. The third time a lamb is offered as a blood sacrifice is the Passover lamb of Exodus 12. This is Moses, God's telling him what to do. Tell the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of the month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. Now, is there one more scripture with that? And the blood, they were put the blood on, on the doorpost and on the sides of, of the door. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Each lamb was offered to cover one household. Every household had a lamb. If they, if they were poor and didn't have a lamb, then they joined with a relative who had one. But the lamb was sacrificed for families and rescued families from the angel of death that was going to pass over Egypt. Jesus, the true Lamb of God, died to save not only you, but your whole household. When you're praying for family members, especially for children, and uh, grandchildren. Know that your faith is backed up by the promises of God and by the power of the blood of Jesus. You know, there are many, many promises for our children in the scriptures, uh, like Isaiah 49, 25, I will contend with him who contends with you, and I will save your children. Uh, your pastor got that prayed over him a few times about him. <laughs> Sorry, John. But I want to present one that comes from the cross. And this one came from a pastor. His name was Myron Corser. When I was a kid, he was the youth pastor at the First Foursquare Church, downtown Wichita. And then he became the pastor of the West Side Church for a while. And then he married, uh, no, it's not Elizabeth, but it's just like Elizabeth. Anyway, he got married and he then pastored the, the sunny side uh, church in Pueblo, Colorado. There was a big four square church down in the main part of town, but they built their little one on the hill where the town had kind of grown over the over the ridge. And he was the pastor there, and 
And when I was a young youth evangelist, he had me come and hold a revival for him, and I knew him. But a, a few years ago, not too long before he passed away, he called me on the phone one day. And he said, God showed me something and told me to share it with you. Me. I don't know why, but he said, God told me to share this with you. He says, I've learned something from praying for my family from the cross. And he says, this is what God showed him. Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they are doing. And he said, God showed me that we can pray. We can pray for our children and grandchildren and ask God to forgive their sins and to help them to think correctly. And you know, every, when he said that, that clicked with me. And uh, I've never studied out, as studying out that verse, I've never found anything that says anything other than that. We have the right to ask God to forgive the sins of our family. Now that gets into a complicated theology, but we have the right to do that. And we have the right to ask God to help them to think correctly. What was the problem with the people at the cross? They weren't thinking correctly. They don't know what they're doing. Okay. The next place the Lamb is mentioned is the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16.34. And this shall be a statute forever for you, that atonement may be made for all the people of Israel once in the year because of all their sins. And Aaron did as the Lord commanded Moses. They offered a blood sacrifice for the high priest, Then they offered two goats as a sacrifice. One was slain and the priest took the blood into the holy place. That's the only time he was allowed to go in there is that one time a year. He went into the holy place and sprinkled the blood on what they called the mercy seat, the covering over, over the, the Ark of the Covenant. And it's interesting that he had to wear these little bells around the bottom of his robe. And as long as they heard those bells ringing, they knew he was okay. But when the bells stopped, they thought, uh-oh, God took him out. And they'd have to pull him out, and he had a rope tied to his feet, and they'd have to, because if they went in, there, went in there, they had died too, so they had to pull him out that way. I don't think it's recorded that any of the high priest ever died. It was, a, it was a fearful thing to go into the holy place. But an interesting testimony of that, I hope I'm not boring you guys with these little stories, but I had an uncle. He was a rough guy. I mean, he was just a rough guy. And he got saved at an Oral Roberts meeting in 1954 when Oral Roberts was here for 30 days, remember that? You? No, none of you don't remember. <laughs> Oral Roberts was here, and he got saved. And he decided he wanted to be filled with the Spirit. But he's just this rugged guy. He didn't want a bunch of women pulling him, saying, speak, brother, speak. You know, let it go, let, you know, hang on, let it go. You know, He, didn't, he wasn't going to do all that. Well, the pastor's wife of the first four square church told him if you will go in a quiet place at your house God will fill you with the Holy Spirit well one day he came back and it had happened God filled him with the Holy Spirit and he began to speak with tongues and it just flowed but he says, there's, there's one thing I don't understand. 
He says, when I started feeling the presence of God, I kept hearing these little bells. They were kind of like jingle bells, but not exactly like that. He says, I kept hearing these bells, and I wonder, what's going on? Well, the pastor explained to him that in the Holy of Holies, the priest would wear bells. And God was letting you know you were there. Isn't that something? We, uh, all the cousins, we were still a little afraid of him, but it was better after that. <laughs> okay. There's one more I want to look at. We're not covering at all, but this this is from Revelation chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. And one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seals, its seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and among the elders stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Seven means he has perfect eyesight. He can see everything. And the horns means there's nothing he can't do. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Who's on the throne? Who's on the throne? Who's on the throne? God's on the throne. And the lamb reaches and takes the seal out of his hands. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Let me stop there for just a second. Don't ever think your prayers are insignificant. Any sincere pray, prayer that's prayed in faith, God has it up in heaven. And even if it didn't seem like it bared fruit when you first prayed it, someday it will. Okay. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood from every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Why there's so much there. We could do a revival on that verse. Now, the reason John was weeping, and it began, the first verse it said, the elders said, don't weep, John. John was weeping because they couldn't find anybody in heaven, anybody under the earth, anybody on the earth, anybody in the ocean, anybody on the land. There is no human being on the face of the whole planet Earth or the universe that could open that book. That book is kind of like the deed to planet Earth. Whoever can open the book owns the earth. And John's weeping because that means nothing's going to change. It's, everything's just going to keep being like it is now. But an elder tapped him on the shoulder. And I, he didn't say that, but I, I kind of look at it that way. Hey, John, don't weep anymore. The lion of the tribe of Judah can open the book. And he says, I saw a lamb as though it had been slain. Remember, the theme of the Bible is that Jesus is the lamb. 
when you read all those bloody things where Solomon slayed a thousand lambs and all of those things in the Old Testament, all of that is about Jesus and the blood he's going to shed for us at the cross. All those bloody sacrifices. You know, I, I, I kind of like the liberals because they can be so stupid. Well, we're not into that butcher house religion. Well, then you don't know God. Because you're not going to get to God without the blood. It just ain't going to happen. I wish there was an easier way, but you're, just, you're not going to get to God without the blood. Why would Solomon slay a thousand lambs? Because he knew somehow there was power in that blood and he wanted all that they could get. John is told to weep, not to weep, because the Lamb of God who had been slain could open the book and rescue planet Earth back from the evil that had gripped it since Adam's fall. The lamb was slain from the foundation of the earth. It says that in 1 Peter 1, 19 and 20. Therefore, the lamb is the Lord of history. You know what that means? He knows how to make this whole plague thing come out right. And he has the authority to do it. If enough people will pray to him and call on him, I think he will. He'll just step in and take care of that. It says that the Lamb is enthroned in heaven by God himself. You know what that means? That means the Lamb, Jesus Christ, is the Lord over the entire universe. That includes the little green men from Mars that people claim they see. He's Lord over them. I don't personally believe that they're there, but if they were, he's Lord over them. I remember getting into a big squabble in the 60s when I was in Bible college because they didn't, you know, they were talking about going to the moon. They hadn't done it yet. And they were talking about, well, you know, how science is going to go to the moon and do all these things. And there's this big argument of whether God wanted people to go to the moon or not. And I remember we're having this big discussion after church. And finally the pastor says, it doesn't matter. The Bible says, even if you exalt yourself like an eagle and set your nest among the stars, from there I'm going to bring you down. It says that in the little book of Amos, Obadiah. It says, from there I'm going to bring you down. Even among the stars. So he's telling everyone, don't get all riled up about this. God's in control of all that. Well, it also says in this verse that because he paid the price for every human of every kind, remember people, tongue, nations, and the Lamb is Lord over all the governments of the earth. Now, some of us don't like the, the gov our government right now. It's it kind of pushed across the Constitution. But you know what? He could take them out in a second. He's Lord over all the governments. Let me give you three other scriptures. Ephesians 1.10 it says that God is putting all, bringing all things together in one in Christ in the dispensation of the fullness of time. Everything's going to be under the control of Christ. That means he's the real government. Or Colossians 1.20, it says that God 
was reconciling all things in heaven and earth in Christ, having made peace through the blood of the cross. Everything is being brought under control because Jesus is the Lamb of God. Or Revelation 1 5, where it just comes out and says it. He is the Prince of the Kings of the earth. You want the government to change? You need help from Jesus. He can do it. I don't mean don't vote and that kind of thing. We've got to do all that stuff, but. Call on Jesus. He can do something about the government. He's the Lamb of God whose blood prevailed. Jesus, the Lamb, will remove all evil from heaven and earth. That day is coming. And when it comes, make sure you're on his side. So, let me just close it this way. Excuse me just a minute. Do not let anyone diminish the power and importance of the blood of Jesus. That shed blood gives you the right and authority to pray about almost everything that's important for us to pray about. You know, the, pat, the aton Day of Atonement, the whole nation of Israel was forgiven when the high priest took the blood in there. Do you know what that tells me? Jesus died to save nations. And we have the right to pray for our nation or any nation. The blood gives us the authority to pray for God to change nations, to save a whole nation. You know, in, uh, there's a time that happened in the year 350, I think it's 350 AD, the nation of Armenia declared itself to be the first Christian nation on earth. Did you know that? That happened. I used to know some Armenians, and, and they were real proud of that. Their nation was the first nation to declare itself a Christian nation on planet earth in 350 AD. That's why the Muslims have tried to annihilate them for a thousand years. So they paid a price for it. And don't let anyone kid you. There's people there that love Jesus with all their heart. Yeah, their rituals are a little different than us. And, you know, they can have church however they want. <laughs> if God wants to bless it, he'll bless it. You have the authority. Now, I'm not saying that every little prayer is going to make a whole nation get saved. If intercessors understand you're talking about a, a lot of work here. A lot of spiritual work that has to happen. But it's possible. Yeah. The blood bought it. Yeah. If the blood bought it, it's possible. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's... Let's do something real quick. If you're here and you're just maybe struggling in some area, it's just, you're just having a struggle. Maybe you need healing or maybe you just, there's situations that you can't get under control that need to get under control in your family or whatever or yourself or you just you just need help. The blood of Jesus was shed to help you.
If you're here and that's you, would you stand up? Because we're going to pray and believe God to whatever the problem is. He's going to help you. It's going to be different because you're here today. Because I plead the blood. Now, don't let some hokey youth pastor that went to college and got stupid tell you, well, there's no word in the Bible. Please. Yes, there is. You have to understand the meaning of the term. Yes. It's a legal term. I, a lawyer pleads his case. We're pleading the blood. Yes. The power of God flows from the cross, and we're asking God to send that power to us right now. Everyone that's See that help me pray. Pray like you were the one standing. Let's believe God to do miracles right now. Yes. Our Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He has taken away our sin and allowed us to stand before you forgiven. And accepted by you, just like he did Abram. Father, you see the need that is on every heart. You understand the struggle. Lord, if it's a physical struggle, we ask you to heal them. Yes. Strengthen their bodies. Do whatever needs to happen, we pray. Lord, if it's a spiritual struggle, we ask you to impart your strength to them. For we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Lord, if there's situations that they just, they just need to be different, they need to get under control, or they just need to go away, I ask that you move in every situation of every person that's standing, that you will meet that need in a way that brings them the greatest good and brings to you your, the greatest glory. In the name of Jesus, we ask this. Thank you, Father. Thank you for Jesus, the Lamb of God, who was slain that every tribe, that every people, every language, every nation can be saved. We thank you for that. Let your Holy Spirit go with them, we pray. Again, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Amen. You may be seated.